Right, well, welcome along to our next episode of the iPhotography podcast. And if you're watching this in video, you can see that I'm joined by Rebecca today. Give us hello. Hi, everyone. So, <laughs> and the dog, and if you, yeah, if you're definitely watching a video version of this, you'll end up seeing the, the odd dogs in the background or what threw me is the, the dog that is actually it's a cushion. <laughs> it's not real. It's not real. But if you're listening to this in the podcast, none of this will make sense. So let's come back to a bit of normality. It's Stephen and Rebecca today. And this is our kind of first like mini episode of a series we've been wanting to do for a while, isn't it? Um, yeah. We've yeah. been fielding kind of questions uh, a couple of weeks ago from a lot of uh, members on iPhotography, and, and we're opening this up to other people as well. So we, we're calling it AAQ. This is our Ask Any Question series. So it's the opportunity for you to kind of basically just ask anything you want to about photography. There's no guarantee we'll necessarily be, answer, be able to answer everything, but I think we'll have a decent shot at it, won't we? We'll yeah, can, we can try. We should be we able to give find our opinions at least. Yeah, that's it. We'll find one way or another to give you some sort of answers. But um, if I forget a little bit later on, you can send us any question. If you want to throw us a question, then just email it to us um, at tutor at iPhotographyCourse.com. Or you can find us on social media. You don't have to be an iPhotography member to submit a question either. So just kind of uh, send that along and then we'll uh, we'll put it in the pot and we'll see what happens. So we've got we've got four questions today, have we, Becca? Yeah, it sounds about right, yeah. Right, so we're just going to go through with the ones that uh, have been sent to us initially. Um, so this first one is from John Gallagher, uh, and John has said, Rebecca, do you consider pinhole photography as good photography or just a learning curve in lighting and control? It's a bit of an interesting one because pinhole photography is its quite a dated method, a very original method of taking photographs, but I mean, have you ever tried it before yourself? I haven't now, and do you know what? I'm such a kind of millennial in the sense that <laughs> even if I try using film cameras, it goes wrong. So <laughs> I try and avoid anything that's not a digital camera. And I have, I have tried 35 mil, yeah. I've tried 50 mil, I've tried medium format and it just goes wrong. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> but I would still consider it an art form. It's still, yeah. I'd still say it's good photography and I think it's quite interesting, isn't it? Oh, I know yeah. um, Nick works a lot with different kind of cyanotypes and different print methods. And I think that's, I like the idea of combining mixed medias and things in that sense as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think there is, there is a lot of merit to that. Definitely. I mean, as, as John's asking kind of, um, do we consider it good photography or just a, a learning curve in lighting and control? I think it, it's tricky because you can, the, the way that it's done, if for anyone that's listening has never done kind of pinhole photography, um, it, it's basically a very, very kind of archaic form of, of capturing an image where effectively you're blacking out an entire room. Sometimes you know, it doesn't actually involve um, a capture of an image on a piece of film. It, sometimes it's just light sensitive paper. Mm -hmm. um, so, so basically an entire room is blacked out and then literally the size of a pinhead is put into literally maybe a piece of, um, you know, a, a rubbish bag or something like that. And it's a pinhole size and that's where the light comes through and then projects up onto a wall or, or whatever you're actually projecting onto. And that's kind of how the image is caught. So it's very, very, very old school. And you know, I think there's probably maybe a few photographers that probably kind of try and do it these days, but it, it's, it's very time intensive because it can take a number of hours for an image to produce, um, so I don't necessarily think it's it's kind of a, a common thing that a lot of people are doing, is it really? It's you'd have to be quite specialized and quite, you know, dedicated patient. to it. Yeah, yeah, patient, <laughs> isn't it? But yeah, I think does it teach you much about light and controlling light? To some degree, I say it would, because you understand how it kind of builds up an image, but also at the same point you're not really controlling it to a large degree because you're just kind of you just literally put that one pinhole isn't it yeah that's saying you're just putting that or that one pinhole kind mm -hmm. of in the in the in the um the fronting whatever you're actually kind of using to block out the light um and then basically just kind of letting the light do the rest of the job really so you know there's no aperture apart obviously the hole is an aperture but you're not changing it you're not changing iso or shut speed or anything like that so i don't think it teaches you necessarily lots and i wouldn't say it's a starting point would you it's not, it's no. not so <laughs> go, go back to the 1900s and, and start learning <laughs> photography that way so i think it's interesting and i i remember actually getting a gift it was literally one of these make your own 
uh, pinhole boxes and I promise it's still somewhere upstairs in my house um, and it's been sat there for years because like you said the same I you know it's it's so easy to go out and take a photograph on your phone or on your digital camera then you know why would you kind of sit down for kind of long periods of time and just try and, and potentially do it for one image and you maybe get it wrong you kind of feel like it may be slightly wasted time though I appreciate mm-hmm. the artistic elements behind it so mm-hmm. so yeah do you think you would ever give it a go? Perhaps. I mean, I'd give it a try to say I've done it and more than likely failed. (laughs) (laughs) I think it is more of an art form, I'd say, because, you know, it's it's like sketches and things. They'd sit down and sketch it, what's in front of them for hours and hours and hours. And I think photographers are a lot faster, aren't they? Yeah, I think nowadays... Yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. (laughs) I think, yeah, it'd be interesting to know people kind of how, how they see photographers, you know, where they are. Uh, maybe from when we were uh, used to shoot film um, to now digital, are we more are we more impatient as a breed, or you know, are we are we just constantly in demand of being able to take the next picture as opposed to kind of thinking about is this the right image and does it look good, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But maybe that's for an, another conversation anyway. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but but thank you, John. Anyway, for sending that question in as well. Hopefully that kind of helps to say. I think it's I think in summary, it's um, it's a very interesting technique to learn. I don't think it's it, it teaches you necessarily the bare bones about you know how to manipulate and control lights somewhat. Um, I think there's other better ways of doing that, and and now having cameras that you know as finely tuned as they are that can probably help you a bit further. But it's certainly something interesting to kind of pursue if you if you want to do something really different. Definitely. Um, so thanks for that. So we've got our next question. Do you have the next question? Yeah, it is from Jo Kayaks, um, and she's asked us um, for some more information on noise reduction apps or tips as well. Ooh, very so, good. Yeah, it is a good question, and I think noise reduction is quite an important thing, um, especially with ISOs going as high as they can nowadays. Um, it's not always the best thing to, to bump it up as, as much as it'll go. Mm. Um, and there are definitely some great apps on the market. Um, and I know uh, Tutor Rachel uses one called Topaz, which is um, a plugin, I think, for Lightroom. Yeah. And that's had some really good reviews. Um, I think it's a bit pricey. I think it is a one off payment. Um, so if, if you're in need of things like that, if you're in need of your ISO to go that high, um, perhaps in situations like wildlife, uh, as Rachel is then uh, we definitely recommend having a look at Topaz. Um, yeah. Is there any other ones that you'd recommend, Stephen? Um, there is, I mean, th- there is some uh, native features within uh, Lightroom and I think potentially actually in Photoshop as well. And therefore, I think if it's there, I wouldn't be surprised if it's in other software, be it like a- Affinity, et cetera, and-, and maybe in Luminar, just basic kind of noise reduction functions. Now, how good they are, obviously, you know, everyone's going to see them differently. I totally agree. I've, I've, I've read many, many good things about Topaz Labs, um, you know, and, and in their ability to actually help noise reduction. The one thing I would always say is that ideally, if you cannot get to the situation where you've got a big problem with noise, that would be better. We're always big kind of advocates of getting it right in camera to begin with. But I appreciate situations uh you know come up where you have to bump up the iso um but if you like you totally said before rebecca if you know your camera's kind of native iso uh regions and, and what kind of levels they work within um because yeah it's great that you can go to 256,000, but it doesn't mean you should do it just means that it's physically capable but it doesn't necessarily mean it'll render a good image so even if you do a little bit of playing around joe with your kind of camera and and finding out kind of in low light what at what point does your kind of camera start to kind of bring up a little bit digital noise because the, there are ways to minimize it a little bit by maybe slowing down the shutter speed a little bit uh working on cameras that have got bigger sensors full frames are always better than like crop sensors um so yeah kind of just being able to kind of play around with things a little bit like that actually in camera first may help but then yeah topaz labs i think is a, is a very good choice um have a look at the noise reduction apps uh, the noise reduction function in lightroom and i think there's also a reduced noise option also in photoshop and i imagine there'll be more uh, in terms of actual apps again i'm 
not say I'm speculative to, to it because I don't know them that well. Um, I've never really kind of had to I'm not say had to use it. May it sound like my own, my images are wonderful, but <laughs> I never go through apps normally to do that. I'm I'm using it more on desktop software. So yeah, if we're, we're talking about software and plugins more so, it's because probably me where me and Rebecca have uh, have kind of experienced it more really. But I know we've got a blog that we wrote a little while ago on iPhotography about shooting in low light. So I'd say that's kind of quite a, a useful little place to have a look at Joe because it'll make get you out of your few scrapes just by changing certain camera settings so you don't have to rely too much on apps and and things like that but as i said it, it does happen a little bit really doesn't it especially when you're when you're shooting at night a lot i'd say yeah definitely and there's there's ways of doing it. as you say you know um if you're shooting at night use a slow shutter speed and a tripod yeah um if you're in darker situations shoot raw um you know capture as much data as you possibly can um it may even be worth it if you're into that sort of field where you are experiencing a lot of low light, uh, upgrading your camera to a bigger sensor, um, just exposing as much light as you possibly can, perhaps upgrading your lenses to a lower aperture. Mm-hmm. Um, it's expensive when you start going into low light situations, but that's the best thing yeah. to do to reduce noise really is to yeah. get it right in camera. That's it. If you're if you're shooting a lot, yeah, in those situations, and Joe, yeah, you've got to really think about that. You may want to invest in the right kit to to kind of suit that type of photography that you're doing. But um, but hopefully that helps. You know, check out Topaz anyway. That's that's one good place to begin with anyway, and uh, and let us know how you get on. Um, so let's move to another question now. This is from uh, Laura Harrison. So Laura has asked, uh, would the tutors mind talking about the favorite go-to lenses and why you like them so much and when you use them? So ladies first, Rebecca. <laughs> this is tough because um, I have a, a couple that I've flipped between and some only recently. Um, so my favorite has always been a 35mm, um, which is it's actually a 19mm by shoot micro four thirds. So it, it converts to 35mm. Um, just because doing shooting portraits, I like people to look like people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if you start going too wide or going too um, too high, then you start adjusting the face shape. Yeah. Um, so if you're shooting with a wider angle, you fatten their faces, <laughs> and if you're shooting with a higher angle, you actually make their faces thinner, um, which is is good in some instances. But <laughs> most people generally look better how they are. Um, so I tend to go for 35 mil. Yeah. Um, I do. I've started recently switching a lot more to tech photography, purely because of the situation we're in right now. There's not a lot of people around, but I have a lot of dogs <laughs> around. <laughs> I think even if it was um, the case that people were around, you'd still prefer the dogs. <laughs> I do, yeah. I do. <laughs> um, but with that, I mean, I love my 90 mil. That gives a great. It's a fixed aperture and it gives that lovely background. Um. But obviously dogs don't stay still as much as people do. Um, so I do use my um, 100 to 300 mil as well, quite a lot for, uh, for dogs, just purely to capture that movement. Um, but they're, they're kind of my go-to hit by lenses. Yeah, moment. I think that's a, that's a good good choice. And it, it's good reasoning that you're choosing the lenses for for obviously the different types of photography that you're doing really because I know as I know with Laura she she mixes in and out of different types of photography um if I'm gonna I'll say an educated guess I think she's using Canon I'm sh- I'm fairly confident on that from what I've seen before <laughs> in her photographs I, I'm not totally wrong here not 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 a stalker <laughs> at all but with that in mind because I've shot a lot on Canon over the years um again I mean it obviously depends upon what you you, you prefer shooting but um there's a beautiful 50 mil lens for Canon um I think it's like a 1.4 I think there's a mega expensive one at 1.2 f1.2 which are lovely um but yeah you are talking the big books there um so I think the 1.4 is really really good choice at 50 mil because like Rebecca said it's pretty much an all-round lens um there's a 100 mil macro which is absolutely phenomenal I've, I've never seen kind of as good a macro lens lens from anyone else with canons uh, and there's a brilliant portrait lens at 85 mil i think it's at 1.2 uh, again you're not talking the cheaper ends um 
but I'd say there was a fantastic, if you, if you wanted to have a look at a serious investment in terms of lenses and, and you know, glass quality. Um, from my perspective, from what I've used currently with Sony, um, I've used a little bit of a mixture of Sony lenses and like a third party one on Sigma. Um, the Sigma 16 mil, uh, I think it's like 1.6, um, super wide, it's like 16 mil. I mean, it, it is on again, a crop sensor. So it's probably closer to about, um, what's that? What we'll 24, 25 mil, um, on a 1.5 crop. Um, but it gets brilliant and, and I can actually get really, really close in, which is quite surprising for a, a wide lens the minimal focus distance is really, really kind of small. So I can actually get in close shots. I can't necessarily get macro quality, but I can actually get a little bit closer than I can on my 50 mil. Um, and neither of them are macro lenses. So it was just a bit of an oddity that, that's come around. So one thing I would say is don't always look at your kind of native camera brands uh, lenses. So if you've got a Canon, don't look always at um, Canon, have a look at some other third party ones like Tamron uh, and Sigma and anybody else that makes lenses uh, that are compatible because I think the quality of them is getting better uh, and yeah. you save so much money. I mean, do you have all Pentax lenses on yours? Hmm. Um, they're all Olympus lenses. Oh, Olympus, sorry, can, is what you're shooting. Again, I can use Panasonic lenses as well. Ah, um, right. So you can you can switch that way a little bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, they work just as well, if not right. better. Yeah. Some, some yeah. You, you can get um, mounts as well, Laura, if you're ever interested. You can also get mounts that uh, mm. fit other lenses from other manufacturers um, or even different uh, ones that are made for kind of full frame sensors if you're working on a cropped one. So it, it, it be, it's becoming so cross compatible these days because lenses, they, they're, they're probably the bigger commodity than uh, camera bodies because camera bodies just go in and out and get discontinued um, so quickly that people keep their lenses because they're the one thing that keeps their value so much so yeah i'd say they're, they're probably my two favorites i have invested in a, a longer telephoto lens for a project i've got kind of coming up this year um and i bought that during lockdown and because of such i've pretty much not taken out the pack <laughs> i think i maybe put it on the camera <laughs> once just to make sure it did work but otherwise i've not really kind of gone far in it because i'm not normally a big fan on telephoto but i'm i'm gonna try and kind of push myself to see if i can kind of integrate it into my work see if it's something of interest so i may have to kind of come back to you on that one really in terms of uh of how good that is um but it'd be lovely to actually know laura what what you're shooting with as well again it's always very interesting to know um you know what what cameras and what lenses people are using to kind of capture the photography because it can help inspire somebody that's just looking for the next step really isn't it you never know you never know yeah i do think it is worth um using a lens that suits that niche as right. well you know as you say uh, i mean i know you do a lot of street photography on the side at the moment um so a telephoto isn't necessarily one that you touch upon, but uh, it's something that could come into that eventually. Um, and the same, you know, my kit bag is very different from Rachel's kit bag or um, Nick's or Emily's, and, and it is just dependent on what you take photos of. Yeah. But definitely get yourself a, a friend with the same uh, camera brands and have a little swap that's it yeah it's sometimes really really good if you can if you can meet up with people now then laura just to to swap lenses and try each other's out it's just like a try before you buy and it, it saves you so yeah. much money honestly <laughs> it's so much easier right so thank you very much for that laura and we'll move on to our last question i told you these were were totally random this this ask any question is it's all still photography <laughs> themed but this is from louise newis and louise had asked about gig photography which um caught our attention because yeah at the minute there's certainly no gigs going on so hopefully this may be useful tips for going forwards into the rest of the year but uh louise has said um, fast shutter speed in uneven lighting doesn't seem to be working for me uh, too much iso and a stage with smoke kind of makes it all a bit noisy and um, she's lucky to have uh, a son that's in a band and it does recording sessions so she's getting to practice with some kind of uh like live music etc so i think she's wanting a few tips for when gigs resume etc so we were just saying before um, how basically you look at gig photography, not necessarily kind of as a, you know, as a, as a, genre, a genre on its own, but as a challenge of working in low light. And if you apply that, then, you know, you, you've got a few ideas already to begin with, if you know how to kind of shoot in low light. But I mean, is there any kind of tips that kind of come straight off the top of your head, Rebecca, for Louise? Um, I mean, gig photography is tough and it's always um, a question that I've been asked by beginners uh, and you know I get asked the question by people with little compact cameras and I'm thinking 
you've got no chance because you need as much light as possible in this instance. So as we spoke about earlier, you need the best kit for this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, one little tip I would give Louise would be to watch the lighting patterns. Um, as you said, it's very uneven. Uh, if you use a blue light, it tends to wash them out completely, same with red. But if you go for more of a yellow light or an orange or a white, you're obviously going to get a more a brighter exposure and a more even complexion. Um, so watch the patterns in the light and try and time your shutter with the lights. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is it, it's hard to do. But if you've got a sun in a band, that's a great place to practice. And the same with the smoke. You know, the smoke's not on all the time. Um, but use that to your advantage as well. You know, if there's patterns in the light and the smoke sticks to the light, then, you know, maybe have the musician more in, in the shade, but then the smoke's not affecting them at all. Yeah. So I definitely keep practicing with it um, and work out different ways that um, are more beneficial for you. And especially if you've got a son in the band, you can kind of give them a little nudge and say, <laughs> shift, <laughs> shift, the right out, shift them out the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, that, that's so true. Yeah. If you've got the ability to kind of position people because you're, you're so right. The first thing I was going to say is you have to watch for the lights because if you're, if you're at a gig uh, and you know, it's all live and you can't control anything. And, and as far as I know, as much as I've never really done any gig photography from people I've spoke to who that have, you get what they call a three song rule. So you're allowed to go into like the press pit at the very front and you get three songs before you're kicked out. So you've got to get all your photographs, which make it look like you've covered an entire concert, but only over three shots. Cause then after that, they, they move you on and that's it. You're done. So you've got to really watch out for where, like you said, the, where the white light falls, um, no, if it's a case that you're trying to photograph a drummer that's at the back of the stage and there's no light on him, as harsh as it sounds, just give it up. I, I wouldn't no. even bother. Exactly. <laughs> you know, if, if someone's going to cast them into darkness, there's maybe a reason for it. But I, I yeah, I would literally have to follow where light is because you've said uh, yourself, Louise, that too much ISO and with the smoke mixed in, it makes it go really noisy. And then you're going to have problems of trying to reduce all that noise, which can could uh, could impact the contrast and the clarity of the images. And then you give yourself a massive kind of headache of, of how to kind of go around it. So just take the images that you know are going to work um, unless you know you can camera can be pushed and, and you can kind of solve it which again those are all tips for working in low light which generally means slow in a shutter speed which is not really ideal for gig photography unless you want that sense of motion um ideally like rebecca said before shooting in raw shooting with a camera that has a, a full frame sensor those would be a little bit better uh, shooting on the widest aperture possible if you if your lens only goes down to 3.5 you'd probably be wanting to go down to like 1.8 1.4 um so you may need a faster lens in that in in, in that instance so there's yeah I think you just got to approach it as a kind of a challenge of low light um, whilst trying to keep your um, shutter speed that little bit higher um, than maybe you normally would just because there's potentially a lot of movement and you've got to move as well. Um, On top of that, again, if you've got people moving around the stage a lot, you may want to use things like kind of object tracking or continuous focus just to be able to keep that because otherwise people may move in and out of focus depending upon where you're, uh, you're centered really. So, so yeah, hopefully that, helps with a few tips really as well but um i don't know when gigs are going to resume when people are going to be back outdoors a while you'll have a lot of space anyway (laughs) that's it yeah fingers crossed it gives you a bit of time to practice anyway if you're if you're going to record in sessions that may help really anyway so so thank you very much for for that louise and i think that's the end of those uh first set of questions really so i think it's been nice it's been a proper challenge of variation hasn't it But send us, send us some more, send us some more. That's what we want. We like a challenge um, and we'll mix it up as much as possible. So yeah, if you've got any kind of unusual, random taxing questions, you know, we'll, we'll have a stab at them by all means. So if you send them in to tutor at iPhotographyCourse.com or you can find us on Facebook, Twitter and, and Instagram and all that and just drop us a question there and we will put it into another future episode. Um but thanks for listening in the meantime if you want to check out any of the other podcasts that we've got obviously you can go back through uh, our feed and hopefully if you've enjoyed it that much you can subscribe follow and you'll kind of catch up on all the uh, next ones um but thank you very much rebecca it's been fun hasn't it it has thank you for having me no no you're very very welcome indeed as well but i'm sure we will do more so this was the uh, our first round of our ask any question mini series podcasts anyway um but yeah thanks very much and hopefully you'll catch us on the next episode <laughs>